Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the UBC Learning Circle, hosted by the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. Uh, we're very pleased today to welcome Crystal Point of the Musqueam Nation to talk to us about the importance of community nurses. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional, ancestral, unceded, and occupied territories of the Hunkamingu speaking Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge the First Nations Health Authority for generously funding the UBC Learning Circle. Um, so, real quick, before we dive into anything else, um, I wanted to quickly point to, uh, to recognize that sometimes some of the topics we cover can be sensitive or emotionally triggering. If that's you uh, for today, then I urge you to please engage in some self care. You know, talk to a friend, an elder, a family, counsel, uh, a counselor, whatever it is that you need. Uh, please make sure you're doing so. Um, so, quickly, introductions. My name is Cole. I'm from the Chowethel First Nation. I'll be facilitating the session today. Other Learning Circle team members in the room but off camera are Cynthia, our production coordinator, and Kaylin, our program assistant. Um, so now that all that kind of non-essential stuff is out of the way, um, Crystal, would you mind introducing yourself and we can kind of get right to it? Sure. Uh, my name is Crystal. I come from the Musqueam Nation. I'm a community health nurse there, and that's what my discussion will be around today. Okay, so we'll get started. Sure. So, I titled our presentation today, Protecting Our People. I feel that's a huge part of what I do um, in my role as a community health nurse. So, in today's discussion, <clears throat> we'll kind of be talking about the importance of community health nursing in First Nations communities, various responsibilities related to the CHN, um, examples of programs and events from my community in Musqueam, and a few success stories at the end, and I'll allow time at the end for questions as well. And I just want to put out there, I know every First Nations community is very different and the role of each CHN in each community varies from community to community. Um, so I'm just simply sharing my um, projects and my work and everything like that. So my road in healthcare started, I started as a homemaker in 2004. I graduated from high school in 2003. So it was one of my first uh, jobs outside of high school and I worked with a lot of elders and those who were just discharged from hospital and had a lot of mobility issues so I would just go in their home and help them clean and tidy up meal prep um, sometimes even just sit with them and they just like the company right. from there I went into school and I became a medical laboratory assistant I graduated in May 2008 um, fun fact, I was actually five and a half months pregnant when I did that program. Wow. I wrote my final on my due date, had my daughter three days later, and went back and finished four weeks of practicum. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So I love that job, and I still miss that job. I worked at BGH from 2009 up until 2017, and I worked part-time as I started nursing school. I started nursing school in 2012, and I finished in 2015. Um, after I graduated from there, I worked in the acute care sector. Uh, I started off here at UBC in the UBC hospital, and then I transitioned into high acuity on the orthopedic trauma unit and worked there for a little bit. My daughter was about seven at the time, and she just had a really hard time with a 12 hour shifts. Mm -hmm. So that was my push into community where the hours are a little bit more shorter. Mm. and allowed for family time and stuff like that. Yeah. So from there, I went into the downtown east side with the Vancouver Native Health Society. And <clears throat> um, that was at the beginning of the ep um, overdose epidemic. And so it became really, really hard when I started losing a lot of my clients to overdoses. Um, so I... Although I made a lot of strong relationships there, and I value them, and I still think about a lot of my clients down there, I moved into Richmond Home Health um, out in Richmond and did a lot of home visits. So it was a lot more clinical than what I'm doing now. Um, and then a position opened up permanently in Musqueam, so I transitioned from Richmond to Musqueam. Um, although when I graduated from nursing, I worked 
casually as a home care nurse and community health nurse since 2016. Yeah. Um, so a little bit about Musqueam. Like Cole mentioned earlier, we are the tradi traditional Hunkalminam speaking people. Today we are a strong growing community of over 1300 members. Many of our members live on a small portion of our traditional territory known as the Musqueam Indian Reserve. It's located south of uh, Marine Drive, close to the Fraser River. Um, <clears throat> and our land, our traditions, our culture, everything is very, very sacred to us and I'm very honored and fortunate to be working with my community. Um, just to give you an overview of the band, the band office is, itself has over 130 employees hmm. and we continue to grow. It seems like all the time our departments just keep getting bigger and bigger. Um, our health department itself, we have the largest department. We have a staff of 25 people and we're looking at hiring three more. So we could be close to 30 by the end of the year. Um, some people to mention in our department, we have great health admin staff, uh, youth and outreach worker, elders workers, um, an art and play therapist, two NADAP workers, chronic disease, chronic disease management coordinator, um, and then myself, the community health nurse and the home care nurse. We also started a primary care clinic um, and it just started growing within the last two years. And it operates out of the Musqueam Elder Center. It's currently in a transition of getting a new space. Hmm. But right now we have one nurse practitioner five days a week and a family doctor once a week. And <clears throat> Indigenous health, it's very, very connected, whether it be to family members, culture, tradition, the land, the ancestors, everything is very, very interconnected. And that's what I base all my programs and my teachings off of, knowing that um, it's very, very deep rooted. Mm -hmm. And just to give different visuals of what I'm talking about, um, the picture on the left is from the Johnson Research uh, Incorporated. The two on the right are from First Nations Health Authority. And it just gives a layered view of family, self, and community in the center, the spiritual, emotional, body, and mind. So mental, physical, emotional, spiritual. And I try and incorporate all of that into all my different programs that I do. Community health nursing at Musqueam specifically um, is based off the practice that each person is responsible for their own health. Our priorities <clears throat> is that the health of the family reflects the health of the community as a whole. And community health um, is run by me and I also have a great assistant that helps me with all my events and programs and workshops. Yeah. And then of course, there's a lot of collaboration between our department and constantly getting feedback from the community on what the demands are, what the needs are. So what we do is link the client to the resources or support services that they need, whether it be mental health, whether it be chronic disease, um, anything and everything we kind of cover. Mm. Utilize the nursing process and development and coordination um, of different programs making sure that it's culturally sensitive, um, health promotion, illness prevention, um, lots and lots of screening and lots of education. Um, I do a prenatal class or a prenatal dropping group once a week and I'll go into more detail in a little bit. So like I mentioned, we work very collaboratively within our health department and also with outside agencies. So First Nations Health um, is a great, great resource. Um, as well as other local resources. So we invite the Robert and Lily Lee Dental Group three to four times a year for dental screenings and other health events. Um, South Mental Health Team, we've really built a strong relationship with them too for our community members. So those mm. are just some examples. Mm. Um, provide opportunities for community members to improve the status of their health or their family's health and I participate in the design and delivery 
of community health programs that address health promotion, illness prevention, health protection across the lifespan. So unlike the home care nurse, my age group varies from preconception all the way up to end of life. Mm -hmm. And the home care nurse, he has kind of like a list of clients um, that register into his program. And they could be various ages too. Um, yeah, so we deal with a variety of age groups. So if you, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. I just ask you. Um, so it seems like when we're looking at this, the community health nurse is really taking a macroscopic perspective on the entire community and trying to assess kind of what health programs, what resources, what education would be most beneficial. Am I kind yes. of hitting, yeah. getting that correctly? Yes. So how do you go about engaging in these partnerships? You mentioned self and some other organizations, but how, like, what does that process look like? I guess from inception to, to completion, like, mm -hmm. do you, who do you collaborate with to decide, okay, like, you know, these are the kind of things that we want to um, have for our community. Um, and then how do you go about making those relationships? One point that we start off at is every health event that we host, we try bringing feedback and have that two-way dialogue where community members are telling us what the demand is. And once mm. we know the demand, then we reach out and look for neighboring organizations. So one event that I had um, just last week, or it was at the beginning of this month. It was you put all on around. So many, it's. it's... <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, it was around harm reduction. So I reached mm -hmm. out to 15 different organizations and we had 15 wow. um, information booths. And one takeaway from that is that we do a passport style um, stamp where they go around and interact with all the um, information booths. And one thing I do on that in particular is I have an open-ended question saying, what is my major takeaway from tonight? And so the major takeaway from that night is I had no idea about all of these resources. Mm -hmm. So it really helped family members um, kind of guide their loved one into whether it be addictions or mental health or both, mm -hmm. um, really tap into those resources and mm -hmm. know that they're right here in the city. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Um, so again, health across the lifespan, um, a big portion is maternal child health. So helping expectant mothers through pregnancy and even with their newborns and once their newborn, newborns move on to toddlers. I also have various programs for child and youth, um, and age groups for that range anywhere from three to 18 years. Adult, adult health, a lot of that is education and screening. Um, chronic disease prevention or management and education. Um, elders health. Um, elders in our community are 60 and mm -hmm. up. Um, it could be different for different communities. Mm -hmm. And then I mentioned earlier palliative or end of life care. Um, really trying to be holistic and aligning with what the client wants. So if the client wants to pass that in the comfort of their home, we try to do everything we can to assist that. And that could not be possible without Vancouver Coastal Health and their community nursing and physicians and everything mm -hmm. like that. Um, so my day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week could be very, very different. I do one-on-one -on -one teaching, uh, group teachings, raising awareness events. So World Diabetes Day is coming up. Um, so we'll be having a lunch and learn on that in November. Lots of different workshops whether I bring in people and co-facilitate or I kind of make up a workshop myself. Mm -hmm. um, Community-wide events. So those are like Aboriginal Day, harm reduction events. Village of Wellness is also coming up in November. Mm. Um, and liaising between different local health organizations. Yeah. So... Early health is really, really important, especially when it comes to pregnancy and newborns. We strive to do everything we can to make sure that the mom feels well supported. So I do a prenatal drop-in group every week. It's Tuesday, we provide lunch, um, $25 voucher to make sure that they're getting nutrition every week, especially if they're breastfeeding. Um, and then under early child health, also we partner with UBC the kinesiology department and do an active kids program and 
Kindergarten Readiness, I partner with the public health nurses in Pacific Spirit, and we do immunizations right on the reserve. Um, so again, just going back to musculum pre and postnatal, it's a drop-in style, um, so the families can make it when they can. Um, a common question that I get, because the vouchers that we give out are from the onset of pregnancy up until three months, um, they say are we to stop coming after three months, and I said no, keep coming, keep coming, like we welcome you, and as the moms get older and their babies get older, they're a great resource to the new moms that just had babies, mm -hmm. and so I said if you come and share your experiences, what worked well for your baby, and like the teething period, like it's really, really great if you just keep coming. Mm -hmm. So typically we stop seeing moms come to the group when mom returns back to work and baby goes into daycare. Mm -hmm. So that could be anywhere from nine months to 18 months. Um, and I try and incorporate a different topic each week. Um, different topics include mental health, so postpartum depression, nutrition for mom and baby and breastfeeding and making sure that they're well hydrated, substance use during pregnancy or even in the home. So secondhand smoke and that the effects on the pregnant mom or the newborn, mm -hmm. um, safe sleep. Um, and I have so much hard copy like handouts. If the mom says, I need more information on sleep or I need more information on teeth and teething and how to brush their teeth. Mm -hmm. um, so I have all of that in my office and just kind of create a little package and go over it with them. Um, and then well baby visits, so I could either do that in the home or they come to our group and we have a scale, we could do the baby's weight every group um, and then measurements and kind of making sure that the baby is trending up the way that the baby should be. Um, so once people, once the families register with me, they're entitled to a $25 voucher from the onset of pregnancy up until the baby is three months old. Reimbursement for two nursing bras, reimbursement for a prenatal class, a one-time gift per family of an electric breast pump, and a box of breast pads up until the baby is 12 months old. And we also do a welcome bag for the baby, so all the mm -hmm. essential needs for the baby when he's a newborn or she's a newborn. Mm -hmm. Um. So I find, like, in the two years that I've been doing this, I found that the most and the highest turnout is that when I invite local um, Musqueam artists or Musqueam staff into our group. And so you can see from the pictures, the top left is earrings that one of my moms did. Mm. The middle is Hunkleminum onesies. So that translates to I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. And we also have Vanessa in the room. It was actually Vanessa that I invited in to do this, and it was such a hit. So I want to do this and make it an ongoing thing. Do they make these onesies in, in like my size? Or <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to ask Vanessa. <laughs> but we did have a mom, and she she comes from a fisherman family, and so the dad goes out fishing every summer, and we actually made the same saying on the onesie to the dad's t-shirt. So mm. we might be able cool. to get you. There we go. <laughs> so there's also many local photographers in Musqueam. So I invite, um, her name is Ruthie. I invite Ruthie in to do a prenatal shoot or newborn shoot. So the top right is from one of the shoots. And it's really basic. All we do is bring in black blankets or um, different colored blankets for background or props. Um, and then the bottom right so from those photo shoots, we did Father's Day frames. And so Janice Carroll, our art and play therapist, came in and helped decorate the Father's Day frames from the prenatal shoots. So oh, cool. just try and incorporate many different topics and activities. Um, dental screening is very important. Um, so we incorporate that into our pre and postnatal group, as well as early childhood. So Robert and Lily Lee, they come out three to four times a year whenever they could fit it in their schedule. And we aim it towards zero to three. But that's not to say that we don't turn away kids that are four or five and not connected to a dentist yet. Mm -hmm. So we try to be inclusive of everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and then the dental hygienists also come with the youth. 
Um, so through the youth outreach, they come around nine times a year. UBC Active Kids, I alluded to this earlier. We partner with the UBC Kinesiology Program and Recreation Department in Musqueam. We do a six to eight week term three times a year. Um, and this one is geared towards children 18 months up to five years old. Um, and we separate them into two groups, so the younger toddler group and then the four and five year olds. Mm -hmm. Um, just to increase their activity, parent participation, um, and then introduce them to sports and kicking balls and playing with balls and just that interaction between their age groups too. Mm -hmm. um, we incorporated snacks because a lot of the kids come straight from daycare and so just to make sure that their bellies are hungry or full before they go and have dinner. So snacks, water, juice, and then we do draws and prizes at the end of the term. Um, some workshops that we do with the youth are around sexual health. We had a girls group. Um, currently, we don't have one right now, but we're looking into partnering with a different department and get that going again. Mm. Um, we held a respecting tobacco and vaping workshop in August. That went over really well. We did a two-spirit workshop and invited Harlan Pruden from BC CDC last summer, and mm. that was really well attended too. Um, and we also like to incorporate general health. So again, diabetes screening, blood pressure, um, just general education on nutrition and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, as well as drum making, traditional songs, and um, painting the drums that we made. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so a lot of my role comes around screening and the importance of screening and why we screen. So early intervention leads to good outcomes. And I bring the mobile mammogram bus two to three times a year, and that bus goes all over the province. So basically, whenever they can fit us in, we mm -hmm. take it. And there we get 25 women screened at each um, visit. And there's always a wait list. Mm. So anywhere from 25 to 30 women get screened. Mm. We also invite the Seabird Mobile Diabetes Clinic, and they do diabetes blood work, eye screening, and education right on site. Um, and another thing that I started since I've been here is standard screening at every health event. So diabetes and blood pressure screening at every health event that we do. Mm. So these are just pictures I thought I would share. Um, the top right is our home care nurse and one of our community members. And we do blood pressure at every event. The left two pictures, so the bras and briefs. We did a bras and briefs lunch and learn. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to separate it. We thought we were gonna do breast cancer awareness and prostate cancer awareness. But there was a husband and wife that came and they said, I wanna learn if she has breast cancer. I wanna learn how to support her and learn all about it. Mm -hmm. And so she said the same, if he gets any kind of cancer, I wanna learn too. So we combined them. And we decorated bras and briefs and hung them in the community center to raise awareness <laughs> for these two cancers. Um, the bottom left corner is a men's health that we did last November. So we did a Movember Lunch and Learn. And we had a panel of different men talking about their different health um, challenges that they faced and kind of shared their stories. Um, and it was an amazing turnout. They said that we've never had that kind of turnout for men's health. We had about 40 guys that came. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it was a really, really good event. Um, so elders health is another big component. We think of our elders as traditional knowledge keepers and value their input. And so every health event that we do, no matter how big or how small, we send out personalized invitations to them and invite them because they always have a lot of input that they, and just really good discussion at every event. Mm -hmm. So we like to keep them included as well. Mm -hmm. um, we have an elders coordinator that works Monday to Friday. So if I have anything upcoming or if I want to kind of drop in and do a health topic at their lunch, that's who I go through. Um, and then we started in the last year that I go to the fitness center with our chronic disease management coordinator once a week to do vitals on the elders that go there. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Um, a lot of elders have different health ailments or different challenges in their health, and they just want to make sure that they're safe while they're working out and not overdoing it. Um, so we met with a rec department last year, and ever since then, I've been in there once a week and making sure that their blood pressure and their heart rate don't spike too much or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And then during that visit too, they'll just kind of give me updates. Oh, I had my blood work this week and oh, I went to see my doctor and just, it's a really, really good thing that we started. Mm -hmm. It's a very integrated and like comprehensive care. Mm -hmm. going on there. Yeah. So a really big push in the last two years, um, especially since the overdose epidemic is harm reduction. So it started off about three years ago that we did a town hall. And at that time I was only working casual and there was other two nurses that took the lead on it. Mm -hmm. And we had about 50 people come to that event. And then last year I did it and again, invited all those different organizations to come in and drew a lot of people in with various different prizes. But we had about 130 people come. Wow. So that was one of the biggest events that I have had the opportunity to spearhead and lead, and it was amazing. Um, and I think I have pictures later, um, and I'll go into that a little bit later. And then we try to do it annually. So we just had another harm reduction event last week, and we had, again, over 100 people. And really, really well turnout, and just really getting that discussion going. Mm -hmm. and decreasing the stigma around drug use and making sure that the people know that there's so many different local resources to tap into. Um, FNHA has been amazing and anytime we have an event, different representatives from FNHA come out and make sure that we're well supported. Mm -hmm. um, they also put out a grant two years ago, so that's also what helped get this event going. And I can say personally, I've trained over 450 people with Take Home Naloxone at various events. So it's actually really exciting. Mm -hmm. And to hear the success stories of people coming back and telling me, like, I used my kit and I reversed an overdose and that person lived is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so just getting into some success stories. This picture is um, off of our stigma board and understanding early detection saves lives, and that's across the board. So whether it be breast cancer, whether it be harm reduction, whether it be mental health, yeah. everything. And so it just really stuck out to me. Um, so again, going back to healthy moms and healthy babies, the bottom left is Janice Carroll came in and we did bath bombs, because <laughs> the moms need to do some self-care too. Mm -hmm. Um, the middle picture is Christmas decorations. So Janice, our art and play therapist, came in and we asked the moms to bring in any pictures that they had. So one mom brought in an ultrasound picture and so we just kind of put it inside a glass uh, bobble and just made their first Christmas decoration. Very okay, cool. Yeah. And so the pictures of the babies is from our pre and postnatal photo shoot. And one particular uh, family, I caught word of the baby just wasn't putting on weight as as he should have been. Um, so I arranged a home visit with the family, and I also called in the public health nurse that comes to our group. Mm -hmm. And we sat down and did a head-to-toe assessment on the baby, kind of went through their daily routine, how baby's eating, elimination patterns. Mm -hmm. and just discovered that it was the formula not being mixed. Instead of two scoops, they were only putting one. Mm -hmm. And so a simple sit down and a simple fix. Baby is now thriving, put on weight, personality, more alert, like just babies thriving. And so that was really, really good outcome. I have to say as well, kind of hearing that story makes... It's wonderful that all of that can happen within the community. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That all of that is handled within our own, or within your nation, within the people that are there. Yeah. There's no need for external organizations to be No, involved. and you know that's what, I mean? what we want. We want yeah. that trust and that relationship and openness to happen. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so no, ma no matter how big or how small, anybody could call me for any kind of question and I'm always there to help. Mm -hmm. And I think that message is getting out and we're very happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, lots of education. Uh, lots of new partnerships with outside organizations. Um, the FNHA Diabetes Educator, um, she came and connected me with different diabetes-specific organizations. Um, so I was able to get lots of different tools and demonstrations when I'm doing one-on-one -on -one teaching if somebody's newly diagnosed. Mm -hmm. So that was a great connection. I've also been working with St. Paul's Diabetes Clinic and building a strong relationship there. We organized a class just for Musqueam community members. Um, that was last August. And the nurse educator and dietitian um, came out twice now to our community. And so one was for a diabetes social. So that's them in the picture with the spinning wheel. And mm -hmm just really making sure that people don't feel judged. A lot of people with diabetes particularly feel like they're going in and nurses or doctors are saying like, your A1C should be this and you should be doing this and you should be doing this and that's yeah. all they hear. So we wanna make sure that they are very open to having that communication and open to saying, why am I struggling? What could I do better? And just making a really safe environment for them. Mm -hmm. And so the picture on the right is a cooking class that we did. So again, the nurse educator and the dietitian came down and we made breakfast, lunch and snack and dinner, um, healthy options and went over the budget, went over the carbs, went over medication and timing, um, just all around education around diabetes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really the focus is giving people the tools to manage their own health mm -hmm. in a positive and appropriate way. Yeah. And so what was cool about that is a lot of people came that weren't diabetic themselves, but they have a lot of family members that are. Yeah. So just making sure everybody um, is on board with the knowledge and the education. So mm -hmm. it's really cool. Yeah. Um, just going back to the harm reduction. So I mentioned earlier that we did a town hall event back in 2017. And then we looked at that and dissected it and wanted to make it more interactive between the community members and the presenters. So that's where we came up with the idea of, one, how do we get input from the community? Mm -hmm. So the art and play therapist, Janice and I came up with this stigma board with the three questions. How do we de decrease stigma and increase seeking help? Harm reduction, any ideas for programs or workshops? Um, and then the last question was, how have addictions impacted your life? Any advice for youth? And so we had this displayed in our community center hallway for about a month, and then we brought it to Aboriginal Day. And then we also brought it to the harm, redu harm reduction event uh, that we held last year. And then we did a call out to local artists and got a couple pieces turned in. And what I really wanted to do as I heard what Squamish Nation was doing and they made their own sign for Stop I Have Naloxone. So I said, Musqueam should do that. Mm -hmm. And so we had one artist come and design a stop sign for us. And so now we actually turned that into a lawn sign that people display outside their home. And if there's any overdose or anything happening in the community, they know that they could go to that house and knock on the door. Mm. Um, so it's really cool. Um, some challenges that we face, especially with harm reduction, is making sure that we are sensitive um, overdose and those um, types of topics have affected so many different families mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that we're not, um, not like dismissing or being insensitive to it. Mm -hmm. So making sure that we're working in the right way with the people. Um, and making sure that they feel inspired to come and get help. Um, so our goals, again, we wanted to make it more interactive and we wanted more and more people to come out. And so her name is Alicia Point. She's the one that designed that stop. I have naloxone sign. And <clears throat> so getting back to the passport idea, everybody that came in was given one ticket and then if they went around and 
engaged with all the information booths, they got another ticket and um, just to double their chances on getting a prize at the end of the night. Mm-hmm. And so this harm reduction event was last summer. We invited three community members to come out and share their stories and inspire other people. So the top left is a gentleman that used art and you can see his painting in the background. Um, He used art and relied on his family and that's how he overcame his addiction. Um, The woman in the middle, she started an AA group in Musqueam. Um, just to help others and shared her story around that. And the picture down in the bottom is just showing everybody um, in attendance that night. And so we had one of our healthcare staff at every table. So when it came time to draw up the take home naloxone and inject and everything and make sure everybody was safe, we had one of our health members at every table. Mm-hmm. And then some of the posters on the right are what people wrote on our stigma board. So more mental health for teens, sharing stories, parent-child discussion groups, um, don't be afraid to ask questions. And so we gave all of this information to our NADAP workers, so they're working on upcoming programs. And there's actually a youth outing coming up in the next couple weeks. So we're really listening to our community and um, trying to do what they want to make sure that we have the greatest turnout. Um, So again, this is the art pieces by the gentleman in the previous slide, and that's the Stop I Have Naloxone design made by Musqueam, one of our local artists. Mm -hmm. Um, So some tips for events that we really, um, it worked really well for us, so maybe it might work well for other communities too, Mm -hmm. is we do a lot of personalized invitations. and a lot of people will bring those invitations and bring it back to us. Mm-hmm. And we have um, Facebook pages and we have a community newsletter, but I find the personalized invitations work the best. Yeah. Um, peer educators. I went to an FNHA um, conference. Again, it was around take home naloxone. And um, what really stuck out to me is the people with lived experiences. So we are now incorporating peer educators into our events as well. Um, So in some of the previous slides, we have a community member who's type 1 diabetic who does all our diabetic screenings. Mm -hmm. So he is amazing and can just share so much information Mm -hmm. in like a two minute conversation. Like it's been really, really well. Um, Lots of networking. So again, looking at local organizations, different people and peer educators. Our aim is to decrease stigma and open up communication um, and really increase the trust. And that could go for any kind of health topic. Mm -hmm. Um, An engaging event, so making sure that there's opportunities for two-way conversations in a safe, non-judgmental space. Um, If you want to do any kind of like your own personal nation um, sign or definition or anything. An artist call out always works. Um, There's so many different types of art, whether it be photography or writing or painting. Um, So including the artists, lots of draws and prizes. Um, And again, a passport style where each information booth is able to stamp the passport. And one thing that I really like and I really like reflecting on is having an open-ended question saying what my major takeaway is from this event. Um, Trying to be inclusive of all ages and a great way to look back and share your work that you're doing is hire a photographer and a local photographer in your community. That's a great way for them to be involved and also work up their work experience as well. Um, community input, so finding new and different ways to include surveys. So again, a display board. Um, one thing that I like to do is poll everywhere. It's a live interactive poll. So mm. I include that in my workshops as well. Mm. Um, 
some initial challenges and even ongoing challenges that I face, again, is trust. A lot of people um, might have had hard experiences no matter what area of health they're in. So making sure that I watch how I talk to somebody, making sure that I have an open door policy, no matter how big or small the issue is, they could always call me or anyone in our department. Mm -hmm. um, many of our community members are financially strained. So making sure that our events, um, whether it be the cooking class, making sure everything was on a budget and our families could actually afford to do those meals. Yeah. Um, so taking that into consideration. And variability. In the two years that I've worked, um, there's so many highs and lows with different demands. So making sure that you're aligning with what the community wants and needs mm -hmm. and being adaptable. And that's it for my power slide. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, so as is, as is common, um, I'll give you guys a couple minutes. I have a couple questions. I have a, a long list of questions, <laughs> and I'll shorten that down to a few. Okay. Um, so if you out there um, have any questions, please pop in the chat box. I think we'll start with that. Uh, Vivian wanted to know where she could get one of those signs. I assume she was referring to the naloxone Oh, the sign. stop, I have naloxone. Mm -hmm. um, we have a bunch still in our department. So you could see any any one of us in the department. Okay. Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, so... One of the questions that I had when we were kind of going through this, mm -hmm. and you touched on it once or twice kind of uh, briefly, where do you, um, how do you incorporate uh, traditional medicines and traditional knowledges in terms of health and wellness into these activities? It mm -hmm. seems like, you know, we contacting the elders and then they kind of provide a lot of that traditional knowledge base. Um, but I was just curious as to like, how you kind of think about that and how that mm -hmm. comes into your work. So one thing I forgot to include, and I knew I should have included it, <laughs> is that we invite, um, we follow the protocol and have somebody from chief and council come and do an opening. Mm. And then we invite an elder to come and do the prayer to make sure that we start off in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of spiritual health, not me specifically, but within our department, we do cedar off, um, cedar brushing. Mm -hmm. uh, once a week and with our upcoming village wellness we will also have different types and we're reaching out to local Musqueam community members to participate in it mm -hmm. but yeah we try to keep that in involved and incorporated in every mm -hmm. event especially the big ones yeah yeah, yeah. that's great um so then uh another question I had it was that you kind of touched on in the last slide there was you know I know that uh, particularly in your role, um, because because you interact with and you manage so many kind of different cases and different age groups and different kind of um, let's say kind of hurdles within health, right, mm -hmm. for your community, um, there must be touching on that trust thing. In some ways, it might be easier for people that are outside of the community and don't have existing familial relationships. As much as those things can be positive to like to help build rapport, mm -hmm. naturally there's a shared history between families. Mm -hmm. And I think my question comes down to how do you manage those? Like how do you separate Crystal as a community member and Crystal as a health professional? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's hard um, because I grew up with these people. Mm -hmm. And like normally on an off-reserve job, I go in and I do my job and then I leave. Mm -hmm. but I still live and work in my community. Mm -hmm. So it, it is hard at times. Um, but really looking at the professional boundaries of my license and my career, so making sure that in a respectful way I'm helping the family, helping the client, but also maintaining the um, guidelines of my profession. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. And confidentiality is a huge piece mm -hmm. because, I don't know, some communities, everybody knows everything. Yeah. And so really making sure confidentiality and when people walk in and when people leave, everything that is talked about in that room stays in that room between the person and I. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I imagine your commitment to that sort of process really helps that trust building mm -hmm. and report, or report building over time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, 
so they kind of related to that do you guys take a lot of uh, data a lot of vital signs you do a lot of these screening mm-hmm. where is that health data stored so we have our own emr so electronic medical record system mm-hmm. Um, we have a different one in our community center from the one at the clinic. The one at the okay. clinic uses Oscar, and we use Ms. Demuth. Okay. So every interaction I have, every group that I do, it's all put into the EMR. Mm-hmm. So that would be kind of if a community or a community member with a similar level of education was looking to implement something, a program, you know, mm-hmm. or to, to start this kind of work in their own community, mm-hmm. that's kind of one of the first steps I would imagine, right, is mm-hmm. kind of figuring out, okay, how are you going to manage yeah. all this confidential yeah. data? Because um, before then, just, it was just paper files, like, locked totally. away in a... Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, but, yeah, luckily now we have a EMR. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay, mm-hmm. cool. Um, so, we don't have any questions yet, so I'm just going to uh, do my usual plug. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, we have some upcoming Learning Circle sessions. We apologize for the general kind of rough, uh, or sorry, the lack of sessions in October. Um, we had a, a cancellation that made it so... But, you know, on the plus side, we have a bevy of sessions coming up in November. We have six sessions in four weeks, um, so we hope that you'll join us for that. Um, One of the early ones we have is on um, when will we be ready. We're doing that in partnership with CTLT, uh, and that's kind of looking at um, uh, how Indigenous professionals access spaces in academics um, and health and, and kind of the related challenges that come along with that. So we really hope that you'll join us for that. Um, and we're hoping, we're crossing our fingers that actually um, Larry Grant, an elder from the Musqueam Nation, is going to come talk to us a little bit about the language program at the end of November. Um, So those are only two of a few sessions that we have um, for coming up in November. We also have uh, Indigenous student experiences that will come up in November as well. We're going to kind of bring some students in from UBC and chat about what that process was like for them coming from community, whether that be a rural or urban community or even kind of off-reserve because of the breadth of Indigenous student experiences that can be found at large institutions. We want to make sure that the information is out there for all of you that are thinking about making that jump to to a big university and kind of what's that, what that is like in the first couple of years. That's very cool. Um, so with that being said, I think we're, we're out of questions. So I wanted to take this time to, to say thank you very sincerely. I really appreciated that. And I feel like I have a whole nother level of understanding and appreciation for all the work that you do. I had yeah. no idea. I had I had an idea of some of the things, but I had no idea that you were behind so many of those projects and so yeah. many of those events. That actually reminded me of another question I had just before, if you don't mind. Nope. How do you guys manage the funding for all of these events? Like, do you do it through grants or kind of how lot. does that work? And who yeah. writes those grants, I suppose? Is that something that you do as well? I, in the harm reduction grant, um, in my first year of working for Musqueam, I actually got us a $50,000 grant. Wow. Um, (laughs) And that was amazing, um, given out by FNHA. So very, very helpful to all Indigenous communities. Um, But no, we do have a grant writer at Musqueam. Um, So I just kind of piled together the um information and statistics around overdose or the benefit of having this grant and different ideas that i wanted to do with the grant Mm -hmm. so i put that all to her and then she put it into the the form that they needed right and does that grant writer kind of look at what grants are like do you come to her with an idea with an idea or with uh something that you want to talk about and then she takes a look at what grants are available to support that or do you kind of do that part yeah i kind of keep an eye out for the different grants and our department looks at health grants specifically um so we look at and a lot come out at different times of year so there's different grants like around aboriginal day and Mm -hmm. stuff like that um so we take our ideas and input and then send it to her and then she does the actual writing process part and are there any um one final follow-up about that are, are there any resources that you would recommend to other communities that were looking to kind of get in um to start applying for more grants is there are there any resources or websites or databases that you would recommend for for people to monitor to see kind of what grants are available for them um, in communities? the first place that i go to all the time is fnha mm-hmm. um they have such a wide variety and Honestly, just kind of connect with the different departments in your nation. So I know rec, recreation and, and health have kind of gone in on a few different grants together. Um, 
and then the Health Canada website as well. So even just Googling what's available mm -hmm. around like your location. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we actually have a couple more questions kind of sliding in right at the buzzer here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Chelsea asks, how can we protect our community as Indigenous peoples not in the health field or health background with mm -hmm. the lens and approach that you speak of? So I guess how can Chelsea, as, as a member of the community but not someone with the training that you have, mm -hmm. how can she kind of have a similar impact or what would you recommend? Um, definitely going, I don't know where Chelsea lives, but definitely going to your band and being an advocate. Um, so depending on what departments are available, mm -hmm. um, kind of tap into them. So if you do have a health department, um, or anybody that kind of does any or organizes any events and stuff like that, um, and then even working your way up to chief and council and mm -hmm. just sliding in there and trying to get your input in there um basically anyone that will listen mm -hmm. and i would go talk to as many and as much departments as i could mm -hmm. yeah, great. and me personally if somebody from the community comes to me with an idea i value and appreciate it mm -hmm. um so i ex i think that she would feel that too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah great so just kind of acting acting as a champion bringing those issues yeah. to the forefront of people that that are in positions where they could kind of put on those events for the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it sounds like to me, just as we're kind of chatting here, that there are tons of resources and organizations and associations that are interested in helping our communities. Mm -hmm. uh, helping might not be the right word, but like collaborating with our communities on these, um, uh, on a, on a variety of things. So I imagine oh, yes. that, you know, Chelsea, if you're passionate about it, if it's something you want to see happen in your community, go and talk to your community leaders, go and talk to your community champions, become one yourself. Um, and it seems like it, it's uh, there's always information, there's always people there. So uh, thanks again very much for your time, Courtney. I appreciate it. Um, we actually have Olivia says, sorry, thank you so much for your great work um, from Darcy and Olivia of Indigenous Health, BC Children's and Women's. Thank you. So yeah, um, I think that's all the time we have here for today. Um, I wanted to thank you all very much for participating and, and listening to our chat. Thank Courtney. you so much for having me. Yeah, it was awesome. It was a great time. Until next time, we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.